Hello and welcome to this wonderful discussion on a subject I think which literally impacts our lives, transforming medicine and redefining life, a life as we know it and humans as we know them uh, today. I think it's not just that uh, medicines are transforming us, we are also transforming medicines. So the discussion today would be about what is happening, how is it happening, what are the guardrails, what should be the guardrails, how do we prepare for these changes, what is good and what is perhaps uh, something that we have to be careful about. I'll be joined by three experts, leaders in the subject. Let me quickly introduce uh, all the three of them. Neeta Farani, Robinson O. Everett, Professor of Law and Philosophy, Director, Duke Science Society, Duke University, USA. Megan Palmer, Executive Director, Biopolicy and Leadership Initiatives, Adjunct Professor, Department of Bioengineering, Stanford University, US. Kuldeep Singh Rajput, Chief Executive Officer of Bioformis USA. And I'm Prandil Sharma from India. We're going to begin, I'm going to start with you, uh, Nita. There is a lot of exciting change which is taking place, but while we'll discuss the examples of that, uh, there, is, there is also some anxiety. There is excitement, but there's anxiety. When we look at uh, issues of um, a digital twin, personalized medicine, uh, we look at uh, issues of data of, of our human bodies floating somewhere in the metaverse, perhaps. Um, how do we prepare for these changes where we should be looking for a better life, but a lot of people want a longer life? How is that playing out? It's a good question. Hi, everybody. I'm glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, I am a ethicist and a futurist. Uh, and what I really focus on is how we ought to think about emerging technologies, how they impact our lives, um, what some of the risks are, and really how do we maximize the benefits of technologies for humanity. Um, and one of them that I've been focusing on a lot recently because of, I think, this extraordinary intersection between advances in artificial intelligence and machine learning, advances in nanotechnology and engineering, has been the developments in, bio in neurotechnology. Um, and I, I think the promises in neurotechnology are extraordinary for everything from really addressing some of the root causes of human suffering from neurological disease and degeneration to mental illness, but of also unlocking a lot of the secrets of the human brain. Um, part of what I think is really exciting in that space is the coming age of wearable neurotechnology. So rather than implanted neurotechnology, neural interface um, as sensors become much smaller, uh, as they become much more integrated into multifunctional devices. So if you can have an EEG sensor in, in each ear as part of your ear pods, uh, where you also take conference calls and you also listen to music, but you have brainwave activity that is being monitored all day, every day. Do we suddenly have Fitbits for the brain that enable us to be able to track brain health in ways that we haven't been able to over time. People are very used to quantifying their own different areas. You go in, you get a cholesterol test, you have a blood test. Um, people use now watches that have ECG sensors that track their heart rate. They're very familiar with their heart health. But there's very little, up until now, understanding of the human brain or self-reflection on it. And I think that that will be extraordinary also a little bit terrifying, because as we realize that we can track and decode a lot of what's happening in the human brain, it opens up significant ethical risks of who is using the data, how are they using the data. It also challenges our own self-conception. You think that you are a morning person. You're here because you believe you're a morning person. You believe you work most productively first thing in the morning. You believe that you're more focused after you have a cup of coffee. And the brain metrics start to tell you that actually it's your worst time of day for focus, <laughs> <laughs> that you are the least productive, you have the most mind wandering. Or you start to see things like cognitive decline that's happening over time and the slowing of your mental processes. How does the quantification of brainwave activity outside of our bodies where we can reflect on it change our conceptions of self? How does it change how we think about who we are? How does it change how other people think who we are? So I'll just start there as a teaser uh, to open up the conversation. Thank you. Megan, 
the phrase bioengineering is so amazing. Uh, I'm an economist, and I know that a lot of scientists are here in the, in the room and, and watching us online as well. So let me ask as an economist, what does bioengineering mean? Does it mean that we create new people out of spare parts like we do with, the, with vehicles and others? Well, uh, first of all, wonderful uh, to be here, especially with such a packed room uh, of science uh, enthusiasts. Um, so I, I'm, at, I'm at Stanford University now in our Department of Bioengineering, but I also work uh, across the university with some of our ethics, society, and technology efforts, um, as well as with our Institute for International Studies, really looking at the ways that advances in science and engineering um, are shaping our, our world, including the ways that we relate to each other and also to ourselves and our shifting environment. And so it's great to be here at, at Davos looking at many of, these, uh, many of these questions. So some of us may be new to bioengineering. Um, at Stanford, this is um, the, the newest uh, engineering, uh, it's the newest department. Uh, the last department that we opened was computer science. And so you can imagine the impacts of this uh, new field that are being anticipated and invested in as we look to what is the next revolution in our ability to solve uh, many problems, not only in health, um, but also in other areas, right, in manufacturing and climate change and, and beyond. Um, but certainly, I think the advances in medicine are some of the most uh, exciting. So my own PhD was in bioengineering and specifically looking at how we understand and engineer uh, our immune system. Our immune system is fascinating, right? It has uh, capacities to right, detect and go after things that it has never seen before. And now, through uh, fields like synthetic biology, which is the area I've primarily focused in in the the last 20 years, we're developing the foundational tools and knowledge in order to be able to engineer our uh, uh, biological systems, right, the most sophisticated technology on the planet, uh, to be able to do new and, and useful things, including potentially reconstituting uh, life itself from those basic components. And so we're looking at the types of advances, like can we can re-engineer our uh, immune system to now be able to precisely go after cancers, right? That's one of the most exciting areas where we've seen uh, dramatic advances. But also, how can we open up new interfaces with our body, not only in the brain, but also in the gut? Can we have sort of real-time surveillance and markers of the types of things we'd like to see? So it's, it's really uh, quite uh, dramatic and very exciting. And you know, you introduced another phrase which uh, some of us uh, would find it new, synthetic biology. Uh, I'm going to come back to you on that. Okay. Uh, Kuldeep, you're using a lot of artificial intelligence. And I think, um, I don't know if it's happening, but it basically means that artificial intelligence is is doing the clinical trials, it's figuring out what's right and wrong with us, and it also means that scientists and researchers are very worried. Is that true? Yeah, so I think there's always uh, both sides to the coin. Um, if you look at the advancements, what, what are happening in the industry today, specifically, um, you know, the pandemic really accelerated two big trends um, which happen worldwide today. One is how do we deliver care, and these are complex care, um, acute care in the home, post-acute care in the home, uh, and bring that hospital into patient's home. And that trend um, we have seen significantly advance over the past um, few years. Um, on the other hand, you mentioned clinical trials. How do we virtualize a trial? It's not easy um, you know, to run a clinical trial. Maybe there are few percentage, like 20 to 30% of trials which could go virtual. And we have seen 10% growth in clinical trial uh, going virtual year on year over the past four years. It's so a 10 billion. If I can interrupt you, Kuldeep, what does going virtual for clinical trial mean? Yeah. So, you know, let's take an example, um, a cardiology trial. Uh, if you want to run a cardiology trial, typically, uh, you know, every three months or six months, the patient comes back to the site or the hospital. Um, does regular lab test, um, you know, maybe imaging, uh, and keeps doing that over a two years duration. 
all the monitoring is very episodic. Um, you know, you're getting four or five data points um, every year or during the visits. And when I say trials are going virtual, there are a few big benefits to it. The first one is, how are we able to continuously monitor patients using sensors, like Nita mentioned, uh, to gather all the data, use the data captured um, you know, to be able to analyze any complications the patients might have or side effects the patients might have more rapidly versus every three or four months, what might traditionally uh, give us very limited information. Second, when trials are going virtual, all the home uh, you know, uh, visits, what traditionally would happen in the hospital, are moving home. So labs in the home, medication in the home, infusion in the home, radiology in the home. Um, so patients don't need to technically go to a site um, and, and you know, take their measurements. Um, and what this really enables um, um, you know, to the pharma companies and to all of us is how can we get drugs faster to the market? Um, you know, decentralized clinical trial or virtual clinical trial significantly reduces trial duration, um, thereby giving us more richer data to be able to get products out to the market. Um, on the flip side, the challenge with decentralized trial is also, um, you know, industry is struggling with patient recruitment. Um, you know, how can we enroll patients, um, um, you know, faster? Um, and do we just do it in a site? Do we just do it in a specific region? But what needs to really happen and really needs to scale, uh, you know, globally is we can enroll patients from anywhere. And what that enables is diverse population in the clinical trial, um, you know, and different demographics, which all of us um, require today. I think that's a great point uh, because digital clinical trials are also about focusing on specific communities, yep. which you often don't get with the diversity. And, and this we saw, uh, and I can give you the example of India, that when we developed many of these COVID vaccines, uh, some that were developed in India were good for Indians and the, and the ethnicity because there's diversity even within, within India. And some of the ones developed in US, they had to be tested in India, whether it would work exactly. on, on the people living in a different context. So uh, that's, I think that's, that's uh, advancing it a lot. Um, Nita, I want to come back to you. You're a futurist and an ethicist. One of the questions which I've always found fascinating is about not just precision medicine, but predictive medicine. Mm -hmm. So where it's happening is that if you have information about a person, perhaps a digital twin where you, know, you have all the information about how the person's heart, lungs, livers uh, uh, work, you can know what's going to happen to them. There are some ideas around that. That has an impact on insurance, that has an impact on uh, social connects, it has an impact on your employment. Um, somebody can look up your CV and find the data. Say, like, I don't think you're going to be around for the next three years, so I'm not giving you a job, <laughs> right? So it sounds facetious, but it, it can have very serious implications. It's exciting, yes. but again, how do we prepare for this? What are the guardrails that we need for it? Yeah, it's, it's such a layered issue, right? So once we can predict the future, and as a futurist, I will say, you cannot predict the future perfectly, right? <laughs> but once you can probabilistically and through modeling be able to much better see what's going to happen. Take, for example, the fact that we already can start to see signs of Alzheimer's many, many decades, potentially, before a person starts to manifest the condition. Do they want to know? Um, and if they don't want to know, uh, should other people have the ability to know? Should an insurance company be able to make choices about whether to cover them? Should an employer have access to that information to make decisions about whether or not they are somebody that they auto, uh, uh, auto employ? A lot of people um, and a lot of different organizations that I work with struggle with questions around genetic predictions. Mm -hmm. So particularly for highly penetrant, um, meaning it's very, very predictive that you'll likely develop the disease, take a disease like ALS, for example, but you don't know when. So you have incredibly high prediction, but very little sense of when the onset would be. 
Um, how do you counsel somebody about how to integrate that information into their lives, whether or not they should do genetic testing, what the implications for their family members may be as well? Because if they have that particular gene, um, that particular mutation, it may very well be that their children have it, or it may very well implicate whether or not they decide to have children to pass that along to their children, whether or not it could be corrected through synthetic biology, whether or not it's something they would want to correct. Um, so, as we have these developments, thinking about how do we make sure that people are prepared for the information that's being developed, but also that society is prepared for the information that's being developed. As an ethicist, what I try to do is to both educate people about the broader set of implications to help them think about the broader set of implications. You want to go under, undergo genetic testing, here's why genetic counseling may be valuable, and the broader set of social and psychological and other issues that you may encounter, even financial ones that may, may shape how you want to think about it. I also try to work with corporations and governments and international organizations to help to define the principles around how that information will be used and governed in society. Should we make it off limits, for example, for an insurance company to have access to that information about individuals and to make choices about them, whether to cover them or to exclude them? Should employers have access to that information? Should the individual have access to that information? Should it come direct to them? Does it have to go through a trusted intermediary? We have to be in an ongoing dialogue. It's very difficult for laws and regulations to keep up with the pace of innovation. But that doesn't mean that so, social organizations, international organizations, nonprofit organizations, non-governmental organizations, and the corporations can't be continuously asking the questions and addressing it as the developments come along. That's, you know, you mentioned corporations, and I'm going to turn to uh, you on that, uh, Megan. You know, the whole idea of precision health, and also you mentioned synthetic biology, also raises the question about who's going to invest in the research for this. We know there is a history of pharma companies only investing in those uh, healthcare issues which can give them the maximum return when you know that, well, 100 million people are going to need this uh, particular uh, medicine, so let's invest in it. We also saw, and I think COVID taught us that uh, the Western world had literally given up on vaccines. It was mostly in the emerging uh, markets, and therefore, uh, they were not investing it. And that's why India, for example, is the largest producer of, of uh, uh, vaccines in the world, because we need it. The African continent needs it. Uh, many of the emerging developing economies need it. My question then to you is, when you have precision medicine, will it increase the healthcare gap? Because only those who can afford it and only a few people <coughs> who can say, well, just make that special cocktail for me. Uh, and I don't mean the cocktail you had last night. Um, but but uh, it will create problems. There's going to be a cost investment uh, uh, you know, configuration which people will have to figure out. Yeah. Well, this is, uh, again, a very multi-layered topic. And it's where we have to realize that we have a choice, right? We have a choice in the types of ambitions and targets that we set for ourselves as we look at the frontiers of science and innovation and medicine and their impacts in society. Uh, we need to have ambitious targets about the types of, of technologies and opportunities that we open up. But we also need to couple those with ambitious targets in terms of equity, right? And the types of experiments that we need organizationally in order to see what works, um, both in terms of outcomes, uh, in terms of the health effects, but also in terms of the trust Right, the trust between communities that helps us to ensure that the types of innovations actually inevitably have the, the intended impacts, um, both in sort of times of stability and in times of, of crises where new types of health burdens uh, emerge, um, of which pandemics are, are certainly a, a, a large one. So a lot of my work uh, over the last uh, 20 years, and uh, certainly over the last uh, dozen or so, have been involved working between um, public research institutions, as well as a number of different private entities, and working 
with uh, the government, both in the U.S. and governments around the world, around how we think about funding and organizing um, science and medicine in order to do exactly these things, right? Be able to deliver the types of, of innovations, but figure out the uh, financing around it, how to incorporate these ethical issues into that appear at all stages of, of discovery um, and innovation. And we actually just had a whole nother panel um, just before this on fostering scientific collaboration um, across borders. And there, what I've learned is that really we do need to try many different models, and the particular model might be different in different contexts. But what's key is committing ourselves to that goal, where there, uh, you know, there not might not be the market today, um, but if a few public leaders stand up and say we are committing to, in order to have um, impacts not just on sort of personal and individual health, but public and societal health, um, then I am very optimistic that we're going to get there. But it won't be it won't be easy. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like you to keep your questions ready, please. Uh, after a quick uh, uh, intervention from Kuldeep, I'd like to come to you and get some of your ideas and thoughts uh, as well. Uh, I have another simple question for you. Will artificial intelligence improve equity or reduce it? Because we, we are we are we are looking at uh, many such uh, situations emerging, yep. uh, uh, Kuldeep. Um, the the challenge is, as as both of them, uh, Megan and Nita, just said, these are serious, complex issues. Is technology going to resolve them or make it worse? I think you know, my perspective is it's going to resolve it. Um, and, and I'll give you a few examples to illustrate that. Today, for um, you know, when you do big data, you have a lot of data, and you try to build population-level models. You always have biases, and you have um, you know when you use AI. But from my perspective, what AI can really do, um, you know, is be able to provide personalized care to patients. I'll give you an example on, on one of the major problems in the US. Let's take heart failure. Um, you know, one in four patients come back and get readmitted um, you know, within 30 days after discharge. Less than 1% of patients with heart failure in the, in the US, as well as worldwide, are on optimal dosage. And that accounts to 60% of uh, the reason why patients come and get um, you know, hospitalized. $160 billion wasted every year. Um, so the question was, um, you know, when, when we started building and, and tackling heart failure five years ago, we said, okay, there are two, two, all these problems, there are two ways we are going to solve it. First, can we predict heart failure exacerbation ahead of time so that clinicians can intervene early so we reduce these rehospitalization? And second, is, is there a way once we detect because we don't want to just stop there. We wanted to go a step further and say, can AI accurately identify the right precise dosing for the patient so that we can get the right dose to the right patients at the right time, eventually improving cost uh, or reducing cost? So we proved that in a number of clinical trials. Today, we manage uh, almost um, half of the entire heart failure population. And um, you know um, what AI could really do is capture continuous um, you know, biomarkers from patients passively in the comfort of their home, use all of that to detect or predict clinical exacerbation, and we um, you know, were able to precisely dose. Um, you know, the biggest challenge for us was um, when we went to the FDA um, and regulators, um, there was a big question around, OK, this has never been done before. Um, how can a, uh, you know, AI automatically dose a patient? Um, every patient uh, with heart failure, 90% of them, in fact, have multiple comorbid conditions. So imagine the complexity in terms of accurately dosing. Of course, it, was, uh, you know, it took a lot of convincing, a lot of clinical trials. Um, and this was the first time FDA, after we uh, ran the trial, granted uh, first ever breakthrough designation for a software. Um, and an AI, which can accurately, um, you know, um, solve the problem. What level of accuracy are we talking about? Yeah. So, um, so specifically, if you look at early detection of heart failure, around 90 to 93 percent um, 
um, you know, accuracy. But for the dosage, I'm worried about the dosage. Dosage, um, you know, the way we reduced that um, issue or we, we sought out that, um, you know, was we always had, um, you know, when there was a level of um, uh, accuracy issue and we felt that a clinical oversight is needed, we had a clinical oversight. Okay, so you uh, still need the humans, right? Uh, we we needed the humans five percent of the times. Oh gosh. Okay. Look, we needed no, the humans. We will not talk about the ninety-five percent, but let's take some. <laughs> let's take no, some but, questions but, from. No, but 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 I'll I'll um, you know finish with one point. In medicine, I don't think um, AI is going to replace physicians and nurses completely. Um, you I like know, the qualification. Yeah, <laughs> nurses and physicians have to use technology to make them more operationally efficient. Right. Um, and that's how um, we are going to see industry evolving over the next five, 10 years. Fair point, because actually even in a hospital room, you know, just checking whether the liquids exactly. uh, are, et cetera, going, or if they're ending their sensors, which can tell and alert the uh, nurse's uh, desk that, you know, something is not happening, please rush into it, even before they physically come and check. So I, I appreciate your point. So let's take some questions. Uh, we'll have a mic here, please. Uh, right here, the gentleman. Yes, if you can raise your hand so that the team can see you. Kindly introduce yourself. Thanks, Jeff Richards, AO Foundation. I'd like to connect all your parts because they're all interesting to this. So, Nita, you mentioned sensors. Sensors are the future. Digitalization is the future. So, we have a new sensor to replace x rays in bone fracture healing so you can see what's going on exactly all the time. It's autonomous. You can see, you can tell the patient directly to their smartphone how they should load, how much they should load, so on. Economical benefit of that is that people don't have to go in the hospital all the time for x-rays, they don't have to have the checkups. It's telling the doctor when there's a problem at the same time, so this is also very good. It's collaborative, it has to be throughout everyone in the world, all the insurance companies, all the legal approval companies have to work with it. And finally, Kuldeep, with your area, AI, this is the nice new bit thinking, that we'll be able, if we can push FDA to do better legal approval on this, all this information can go in for an actual clinical trial AI without having to have huge costs for the nurse studies and so on. And it would say it really would save a lot of money. And census, that's just an example. You could do this everywhere. So digitization is really the massive and, it, uh, and it's coming as a future. Let me Thank add you. one thing just in, in response to this, which is <coughs> agree. I think that was a really nice connection between the three. One thing that um, was a little chilling to me to hear last night at dinner, uh, a really terrific futurist, Amy Webb, was speaking. Um, and she mentioned something that had not really been on my radar, but I think should be on all of our radar, which is the coming possibility of deep fakes within medicine. Um, and so as you think about the cybersecurity issues between people who have sensors at home, x-rays at home, information traveling between the hospital uh, and individuals, uh, you know, mobile devices, um, and the possibility of deep fakes and generative deep fakes, you know, uh, you, know you, you have problems with the fracture healing, you don't have problems with the fracture healing. There's a lot of potential risk that we have to address. And that's just one of the kind of areas where if we're thinking carefully about this is exciting potential, we're all incredibly excited about the possibilities of transforming health. We need to make sure that we're attendant to the risks of it so that as we start to adopt it, we're integrating additional security measures, additional ethical guardrails on it to have it really help us in the best possible way. That's a great point. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, India's premier uh, uh, medical institute was hacked into. Uh, we still don't know who or why. I mean, we have some ideas. I can't mention them now. But um, the lot of data of patients could have been not just stolen but altered. Yes. Yeah. It's um, so. I, part of my work, I spent, I guess, seven years at the Center for International Security and and Cooperation, in which I was actually one of the few scientists working with a lot of uh, political scientists and and security experts, really working uh, across domains. And just wanted to emphasize exactly this. Along, you know, every stage of innovation, we also need to look at what could go wrong in a sort of constructive way in order to build um, new tools, but um, also to do these types of scenario developments that really stretch our are thinking about uh, what's possible, and underlying a lot of this is, you know, how do we engineer uh, trust and integrity into these systems uh, at all levels? And just one last note on it: I think this is an area where we can um, put our to work our science and innovation system, not not you know treating these things as things to be sort of circumvented, but actually treating them as science and and design uh, questions unto themselves. And I've seen so many different communities really being motivated 
complicated around exactly asking, asking those questions. Quick intervention from you, and then yeah. you have more questions. I'll, I'll probably add one point to what you said. Um, you know, X-ray and other things in the home, one of the things which we all need to be aware of, and we have been seeing that, healthcare is too fragmented with a lot of point-of-care solutions. <laughs> Um, you know, health systems, for example, uh, you know, are using 10 different vendors, 10 different solutions to solve a single problem. But eventually what matters is how do you deliver a holistic care to patients in the home? And now the question really is, um, who is that going to be? Because payers, you know, pay for outcomes. Uh, for example, radiology in the home, not, you know, can you have a single care at home platform which enables management of patients throughout the care continuum, including acute care in the home, post-acute care in the home, transition the patients um, to chronic care, and um, you know, tailor the levels of services you require uh, in the comfort of their home. So um, you know, yes, um, you know, it all depends on patient outcomes, um, you know, clinical um, you know, benefits, operational benefits, and how do we improve um, you know, um, economic benefits. So um, that's what payers care about. That's how, uh, you know, regulators look at it. Um, and, um, you know, um, all of us and the industry, we see and we will continue to see a lot of consolidation happening. A um, lot of point of care solutions will be integrated. We'll see a lot of consolidators already emerging, and that trend will continue in the next 12 to 24 months. We could, we could effectively, effectively have an ERP for our bodies. Right. So, anyway, uh, any other questions and thoughts from from the audience? I think everybody is stunned into silence. Yeah. Yes, Thank the you. lady right here. Thank you very much for exciting discussion, Milena Sokolowska from University of Zurich. I have a question about AI because AI in medicine, so far as I am concerned, cannot compete with AI in other parts of the of of the industry. For example, you will never get so much data sets as <laughs> Facebook has, and so on. And we know the algorithms are better when you have bigger database. So, and the same algorithm, the same AI is used in the food industry to make people heart failure because they use the, they eat too much and the food industry want them to eat too much so how you compete with that yeah so i think um, you know there is there 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 are two different things which we need to or um, you know the industry need to be aware of in healthcare as you said data is limited uh, but the quality data annotated data is very limited there's a lot of data, but how do you the, the kind of data you need to do the application what you are looking for is limited. Um, however, you know, in consumer world or other industry, um, they are solving you know multiple problems using AI. In healthcare, I think it's important that we all um, you know focus on one single thing what we are doing and the problem we are solving. For example, radiology um, or imaging. Um, you know, an AI to be able to accurately detect certain things works. Uh, and we have seen that over and over again, multiple regulatory clearances by the FDA for that piece of technology. So I think it will evolve. Um, what is extremely critical, um, you know, and, and something for all of us to think about is health systems, especially in the US, think about data as their core asset without having uh, an ability to share it with people, share it with companies, um, you know, who could then utilize it to build, um, you know, solutions. So how are we going to access data? Uh, how are we going to get access to long-term longitudinal data with highly uh, accurate annotations is extremely important. For us, um, you know, um, our, our biggest focus um, has all been about how can we early detect certain clinical complications in patients? Um, we are not using it or we are not using AI um, to diagnose something. And it's not going to get there immediately anytime soon. As I said, if we can, um, you know, <coughs> reduce the false alarm burden rate, um, you know, of any alerts, we would be able to improve operational benefits um, and increase the nurse to patient ratio significantly. Uh, and that's one of the biggest benefit of, um, you know, AI we see today. But being able to accurately diagnose, um, you know, we are not there yet. 
I'm just going to build on this a little because in some of our sessions here at, at Davos on AI and on investing in AI, um, they remark that uh, this area in health and in precision medicine is some of the most exciting. And certainly we've learned that quantity of data, but also quality of data and being able to append different data sets uh, together and annotate them is a significant uh, challenge. But we've already seen uh, dramatic advances, again, in, in genomics and the ability to then uh, look at you know, the vast array of knowledge and how to, how to predict targets and how to predict more than one target you know, in a cell at a time so that we can recombine them in, in new and dramatic ways. And this ends up being also at the social scale or very personal, right? I have a family member who has a rare genetic disease and the, the data set to be able to actually detect that, right, as a, as a particular change in the genetic code that, that, uh, that delivered this was not available, right, 10 years ago. And so even though there are these challenges of how to, um, how, you know, how to develop these data sets, they offer really, uh, really dramatic discoveries. And we're seeing investments in some of these other types of everything from large language models and other types of AI tools being unleashed within biological data sets in ways that um, can now do things like predict the folding of, of proteins with uh, amazing accuracy um, that in many ways we, we couldn't have dreamed of. So the, the closer you get to um, people, right, and social systems and economic systems and otherwise, the data gets even more difficult to, to manage. Um, but if we start at looking even just at the, the molecular scale, um, there's dramatic things that, that are possible. I, I want to come at your question a slightly different way. I want to ask all of you a question, which is I've talked about how I think that uh, wearable brain sensors are coming. We don't have very good brain data sets right now, particularly of healthy individuals with continuous monitoring over time. How many of you will willingly share your data, your brain data, continuous monitoring of your brain? Okay, you didn't ask me with whom, <laughs> right? But okay, so this is a group of scientists, about a third of you raised your hand. How many of you would be nervous about sharing your neural data? Yeah, about half of you. Okay, I think part of the problem is a people and a social problem, which is we haven't created a system of trust for people to confidently share their data and not fear that the data will be misused against them and also to believe that they're part of the return on investments of sharing their data. We have commodification of data that's happening by big tech companies, as you mentioned. We have commodification of data that's happening in a lot of different sectors. We all in this room understand that the only way we're gonna to get to the tremendous insights that we need in health, the only way we'll get to the tremendous insights that we need to be able to address neurological disease and suffering is if we can actually build large, rich data sets associated with a lot of our other behaviors and information. But that means that it's a social system problem of designing the world in a way that enables us to confidently share our data, where it's not about access restrictions to data, it's about minimizing the harms of doing so and maximizing the benefits to all of us of sharing data. But that's why I think this is a social problem in health, is that a lot of people treat it and believe that it's really incredibly sensitive, which is a proxy for, I fear, some form of dignitary harm or other kind of misuse of my data against me. And if we can design our world differently, which we can, so that that's not the fear that people have, but there's actually a benefit that they see societally for humanity to share their data, then we'll get these insights. AI will transform and revolutionize healthcare and what it means to be human, how we treat health and our bodies and our longevity, but only if we can confidently share our data. Yes, I think there are two questions, the three actually, and you know, things are picking up. So let's collect the questions. We have six minutes left, so uh, I'll request you all to be brief. Let's collect all the thoughts and then come to the panel. So I want to make a comment on um, the future, but looking at the past. Mm -hmm. Look, the ancient human being invented glass. He, he had a glass in his hand, and it was a bottle of glass. He could drink. It was clean. It was great. Then one crazy guy took the glass, broke it, and killed somebody. Wow. 
that great glass, now it's just sweating on human being. What the society did, we are all as a human being, found a way to discipline, to control, to regulate, and we used a good, good, a, a good use of, to the glass. The same challenges came during the Industrial Revolution. And again, human being. So what I'm trying to say, we as a society must regulate, do more advance to improve our life and confidence, do another, some bad guy always will come, the crazy guy that kills some always will come, then we need to find another way how to improve it and how as a human being we leverage the value and not be afraid of those changes. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, can I just There's collect the questions? Because we have just five minutes. I'd like Great. everybody to get some thoughts. And, yeah, thank you. Hi, it was also a... a can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, my name is Martin Stoddart, also a AO Foundation. It was also a similar thing. I think there's a theme coming about trust. And the, ang the angle I was interested in is how can we, as the, the problems and the solutions become more complex yeah. and more difficult to explain, so how can we build societal trust when at the same time we have misinformation where basically someone can quite simply say, oh, a vaccine will make you sterile. Right. And that's a simple solution which lots of people then become fearful. How can we as a scientific community tackle this, this societal that, trust? That's issue? a great point. Uh, I saw another hand uh, and then the lady in the front. Hi, Monica. Monica Weinberg, I'm an internist, and I'm just, um, thank you um, for a great uh, discussion. Um, I'm really excited to hear about the monitoring with heart failure, and I guess in hearing some of that, I'm just wondering, I'd love to hear if there's any other, like in the pipeline, practical applications, like things of, in terms of monitoring that like might be on the forefront, for example, like diabetes, yeah. um, development of atherosclerotic disease, things like that. Thank you, one last point from here in the front. I'm sorry, we're running out of time. This is, this is going to be a great discussion, but they will be available here for interaction later. Hi, I'm uh, Sanchita. I work for the WHO in India. I wanted to come back to the question of equity. When will these advances be uh, available at affordable and, and at scale to developing countries? So what I'll request uh, three of you is to you know, give a one minute answer to, to all the points. You, you can freely choose whichever you want. So. Wait, why don't we start? start at the okay, end. I'll start okay. uh, you know, with your question. Um, you know, acute care in the home, or uh, as you know, internist, um, you know, ED in the home started uh, emerging during the <laughs> pandemic or just before the pandemic. As you know, emergency rooms were you know, flooded. Every health system in the country um, um, you know, was looking at freeing up beds. So we had to um, you know, build a whole care model where we are able to bring emergency room and deliver that same quality of care uh, in the comfort of patients' home with the same level of safety. Um, and, and we were able to show that, and that involves over 60 different kinds of diseases. Uh, heart failure, COPD, asthma, pneumonia, cellulitis, UTI, like diabetes, uh, multiple comorbid conditions. Um, and that's where things like uh, the point of care solution, radiology in the home, imaging in the home, uh, IVs, um, you know, all need to be delivered. And what um, I'll also add is, uh, you know, because it was uh, such a big need, uh, CMS and the reimbursement uh, agencies started reimbursing, uh, you know, for acute care in the home. And recently, there was a two-year um, extension. So this will continue to evolve, um, you know, and there will be multiple diseases, multiple comorbid conditions, and how can we bring that holistic care to the patient in the comfort of their home seamlessly is extremely important. Thank you. Megan? I would love to address the comment about you know, technologies that can help and harm and how we navigate those. That's a lot of what my uh, research group spends their time on. And what's interesting is we have the capacity to couple right, science, technology, innovations that can help us do things more safely or at least monitor the systems and you know, knowing their state. But also we need to couple it with social and behavioral approaches to engineer at this, at this social scale, as we discussed before. So my research group at Stanford has uh, folks coming from bioengineering, but also coming from social psychology and anthropology and economics um, in order to really look at how do we 
again, engineer on both of these of both of these levels because it's not going to be one or the other. And also, how do we design those systems to anticipate the things that that will go wrong and try to prepare in advance? So there's there's a lot of science and innovation to couple here. Thank you, Nita. It's hard to close out a session with these big questions, but I'm going to address the issue of trust. Um, because the way we get to confidence in the systems, the way we get to really harnessing the power for good for humanity is by building a system of trust. And I think there's just two small pieces of this that I will say we need to be addressing now. One is transparency. There are errors, there are limitations. We can't overhype science, we can't overhype the benefits. We have to be transparent about the limitations whether that's the data sets, the bias, the errors, anything that we see, we have to be transparent about. And the second is we have to realize that it isn't just about a communication or a one-way dialogue from scientists to the rest of the public. It's a bilateral conversation. The patient, the individual's lived experience is an essential part of the conversation to figure out what is the beneficial application, what are the things that people want to use. Great, we have sensors. Do people want to wear them? Is it something that is comfortable for them? Do they want to share their data? If not, why not? How does it feel at night when they sleep with it? And I say that because as long as we're having a bilateral conversation continuously over time, as a society, through this process of democratic deliberation, we will both build trust, but we'll also have the use cases that are beneficial for society and the ones that society wants, not ones that are imposed upon them. Thank you. I'll, I'll close with just three words. I think what we all could agree on is that uh, as science advances, technology accelerates it, we have to remember security, trust, and equity should be the key pillars that would define the new building blocks of advances. Thank you so much for joining us, and please join me in thanking the speakers. <laughs>